I'm Brent Weaver and you're watching YouGurus, the must-watch web series to become a more profitable and in-demand web professional. Today, I'm in Denver, Colorado, hanging out at the offices of SendGrid with their CEO, Jim Franklin. Welcome to the program. Thanks, great to be here. So Jim, how did you get your start in SendGrid? Well, that's kind of a long story. Uh, SendGrid started in Boulder in the summer of 09, and I've been in Boulder since 1992. Uh, working with startups in one capacity or another. And in 2010, I had left uh, Oracle to really just be a board member, an investor, a uh, full-time advisor to startups. Uh, when uh, Brad Feld, uh, who was an investor early on in SendGrid, uh, encouraged me to you know, come back uh, to work full-time uh, as CEO at SendGrid. And over a multi-month process of getting to know the board members, and especially the founders, I realized what a special uh, company uh, that it already was uh, back there in the uh, spring of 2011 when I ended up joining the company. Now, for those of us that don't or aren't familiar with SendGrid, like we use SendGrid at YouGurus, um, but for those of us that aren't familiar, could you give us maybe the quick elevator pitch on exactly what SendGrid does? Well, SendGrid, rather simply, moves mail from a web application to the inbox of the customer of that web application. It's really best described through examples. Uh, if anyone uh, here has used uh, Pinterest, and you've received an email from Pinterest, that's really SendGrid sending that email on behalf of Pinterest. Or if you've uh, reserved a car with Uber, uh, that's Twilio that sends you the text message saying your driver is arriving, but it's SendGrid who sends you the receipt so you can expense, the, uh, expense that through your accounting department. If you've rented a house with Airbnb and you get the directions to the house or the, you know, the, the rental contract or the receipt, that's SendGrid underneath that, moving that email from Airbnb to uh, the Airbnb customer. So the, the so specific problem we solve is that 20% of those emails go missing. If you try to do it yourself, sending email from a cloud-based application to get to their customer, it doesn't happen reliably. And that really has to do with spam. Uh, that if you, the, the good and the bad part of cloud computing is it's very easy and quick to create a new website, create a new application. And when, you, when you've created something new, and you start to send mail from a new IP address, uh, the receivers, you know, Gmail and Hotmail, Yahoo, are very skeptical of new senders. And they like to throw your mail into the trash or throw it on the floor or bounce it into outer space. And so by s sending it through SendGrid first and then we send it to the customer, it becomes a trusted sender and gets to the inbox. So you named a couple of pretty big apps, Pinterest, Airbnb, Uber. So for any web professional out there that's not currently using SendGrid, they're probably experiencing SendGrid at some level. Yes, we have over two and a half billion unique email addresses we send to every month. So if you are doing anything <laughs> at all interesting on the, you know, the interwebs out there, you're receiving email from SendGrid. So you mentioned two and a half billion emails a month. How many actual emails are you guys sending? I mean, give me, give me an idea of volume so here. So 12 billion emails per month we send to those two and a half billion unique addresses. So that's about 5,000 per second, 24 seven. Another way to think about it is like Twitter. Uh, we send as many emails as Twitter sends tweets. That's pretty huge. That's a lot of mail. It's about 2% of the world's non-spam email. So our mission is to send the world's wanted mail. So we want to send the right message at the right time and the right frequency uh, so that that's wanted mail. So now on this interview series, I've been talking to a bunch of agency owners. So people that have service companies and they're you know, billing uh, by time and they're building custom applications, websites, marketing campaigns, all that kind of stuff for customers. You guys are different. You're a product company. Um, how, how is that different? So product and service companies are, uh, I think, uh, vastly different. Um, and what's interesting is that a, a service company has to think about uh, you know, uh, contracts for revenue and trading you know, time for money. And there are some advantages to that, that your, your customers get exactly what they want, because that's what you're paid to deliver. Uh, versus a product company, you have more of an internal focus, and you build things on your own schedule and release products when you're ready, and you don't have that, uh, that, that time-based demand from external uh, uh, customers. Um, what's interesting is that software as a service, we kind of blend the two uh, at SendGrid. So while we provide a, uh, a product uh, as a software service, uh, we really focus on the human element. So we have a very good 24-7 support uh, group, uh, as well as an account management group uh, and developer relations, uh, a group of people that get to wear these blue t-shirts and travel the world attending hackathons and meetups and startup weekends and those kinds of events. We want to be with people at that moment of creation, they're creating something new, and just to wire in SendGrid from that very first weekend that you're starting something. 
think as a, an agency, when you're building applications, the general rule is that you know, there's so many uh, easily accessible APIs to make your, you know, your job easier, uh, and they're free to start, and it's just is a no-brainer to wind in things uh, like SendGrid you know, early on in projects. And it's only when you get scale and you're sending thousands of messages per month that you start to pay even like $10 a month. So it really is a trivial cost, and it's not paid until after your application has a lot of traction. Um, one of the things that comes up uh, often in these conversations is that product and service dilemma. Because it seems like most of the companies that are service-based are like looking over the fence, they think the grass is maybe a little bit greener on the other side, whereas you guys are you know, more purebred product. I mean, you do have that customer service element, the software as a service element. Why do you think it is that service companies have such an obsession with thinking about maybe creating a product one day? Well, that's an easy one. I've been on both sides of that argument for over 10 years, maybe 20. And that uh, as services people, you look at the product side and say, wow, there's great scale and margins there. When you look at the service business, you think you're delivering what the customer wants, but you're trading time for money. And that's a fundamental limitation. I was originally trained as a lawyer and an accountant. And those professions also trade time for money. So no matter how expensive a lawyer you are, you charge $1,000 an hour. And you, know, you still have to bill you know, that 2,000 hours a year. That's, you're limited by your time. Where you know, a SendGrid or a product company, you know, we sell in 12 billion emails a month, right? And we could send 13 billion for the same cost. And I can be sitting on a beach in Jamaica, <laughs> uh, spring break around here two weeks ago, uh, and you know, we, you know, people self-serve. They come to our website, give us a credit card, send mail, we get paid. It's just beautiful, high margin, you know, scaling business. And so I've been uh, part of many discussions where a service company says, wow, we've created these tools to help us deliver our service. We'd like to productize them. Or I'll be a part of a product company and we say, wow, it's, you know, our customers have a problem and then we sell them our product and now they have two problems. Their original problem plus this product that just showed up. They've got to figure out how to use it and apply <laughs> it to solve their first problem. And it's like, so if you're a product company, you think, wow, I wish I had a service component so I could provide the whole solution to the customer and solve their problem. And as a services company, you think, wow, I'd like to take these tools and turn them into products. But there are you know, many differences to that. It's really like oil and water. There are different kinds of organizations. And I think people have DNA where you're either service or your product. So if you're a services company and you really want to create a product company, I suggest you start with a different entity and a different management team and a different funding source and just take your tool set and put it into that entity. And maybe you own 15 or 20 percent of it and let someone else who are really product people and that's how they live, breathe, and think, you know, take that to market. Uh, it's even things like the accounting system between the two companies would be different. You have you know, time and materials on, the, on your services business, and you have you know, dedicated software that's built for recurring uh, software transactions on a, on a product company. Certainly, sales teams are very different, uh, selling services versus selling products. One of the things you mentioned was that SendGrid has this like, service element. Uh, how have you structured uh, customer service at SendGrid? Like, how does that work? What, what makes yeah. it different? So we look at you know, SaaS, software as a service. We like to really put a, a strong emphasis on the service piece. And really from day one, the very first hire at SendGrid, past the first three founders who were all technical, was a customer service person who could answer questions and help you know, developers work with our infrastructure. And that you know, freed up our developers to continue to you know, innovate and build on the, on the product. Um, we wanted to make sure that you know, developers could have that high level of service. So we do it through a, a multi-tiered uh, support group uh, that runs 24-7, uh, phone, chat, and email, uh, with agents based here in Colorado, both Boulder, Denver, as well as Anaheim, and also over in Romania uh, to help cover you know, around-the-clock service. We also do uh, service on uh, the web, having very good documentation. So we find that developers you know, globally uh, can read English and can uh, you know, understand code samples by having a lot of code libraries so that people can really self-serve to the extent that they can. So when you came into SunGrid, it was kind of like post-founding. I mean, it, it had been, the company had been created, they had a base product, and they kind of brought you more in at that scale level. What were some of the challenges that you had to overcome to take a, a company from a founding level to scale like you guys have? So it was about 20 employees uh, when I joined. So I think that there are some nuances when you're, you're just founders. Uh, is, you know, it's just us, right? And then you get the first 10 employees, and you have a few people who are non-technical, and that creates some issues. And then as you start to get to you know, 20 people, and you've got maybe managers and, uh, and individual contributors, 
And uh, I find that the 25th person, a very interesting thing happens. That 25th person shows up, and they think there's a company. And they'll ask you things about, like, are we open on President's Day? And what's our <laughs> maternity leave policy? And all of these things. And founders tend to look at each other and be like, who's this person? <laughs> it's just us, right? It's like, we're all here working hard to try and, you know, change the world in some one way or another. Uh, so, so I really like joining a company that 20 to 25 people because you're, you're big enough and they had really good revenue traction and the growth curve was already well established. Uh, but really just to take it and kind of remove blocks and obstacles and do things like uh, having weekly all hands meetings and running management team meetings and having uh, a hiring process. It's not just, hey, I had beers with the founder and you show up Monday and you know, bring your own computer, right? And it's just, uh, <laughs> It's just basic things like having an office. Uh, our employees in California work from home, and there really wasn't a center of gravity in that group. So we put a flag in the ground and said, we're going to have an office and have an office manager and uh, all wear the same kind of T-shirts every day and recognize birthdays and really create that sense of uh, place. Uh, and then our, I think our biggest challenge has really been communication, just internal communication. Uh, having a technical office in California and a non-technical office in Colorado can create a bit of a divide. Um, the five most dangerous words in business are how hard can it be? And before I joined SendGrid, part of my playbook as a CEO was to have one office. So I think it's very important uh, as you're scaling from 20 to 100 people uh, is to have that communication between sales and marketing and accounting and service people and, and technical people. It's a, it's a big challenge, even if you're all in the same location. But I thought Denver, Los Angeles, direct flights, one time zone, how hard can it be? <laughs> well, the first big mistake I made was uh, we had uh, Rackspace, was a great partner, but uh, they forced us to an external deadline. We had to dance, you know, when you, when you work with bigger companies, that's called dancing with elephants. When they said, you need to be ready to go on this certain date, I said, okay, we'll do it. But then we had to put some pressure on our technical team to make sure it got done. And uh, that was not well received, to have a non-technical person you know, tell technical people what they had to get done by a certain deadline. And that had created a, if there was a crack in the organization, I made it a lot wider in my first 90 days. And so to heal that crack, uh, I applied the formula of jet fuel and alcohol. <laughs> and uh, that means you fly back and forth a lot, uh, so you can see each other, as well as hip chat and life size and all those other technologies. Uh, and then I'd ask the, the founders in California, I said, okay, what would you like to do to these non-technical people in Colorado? And they said, we would like to shoot you. I said, fair enough. So we'll fly down there. And we went to a paintball range. And uh, being Coloradoans, we showed up in shorts and t-shirts figuring, hey, it's somewhere in California. And uh, the people who knew what they were doing showed up in full camo gear and custom guns. And let's just say it was a really fun afternoon, had by all. And then we went out for a nice dinner afterwards. And it's that kind of building bridges would have been just symbolic. But over the following months, I think really to help pull the company together is where we institute our Mexico kickoff trip. So in about the third week of January, uh, we spend four days together in a resort in Mexico. We've done Cancun and Puerto Vallarta and Cabo these last three years. And it's great to bring the whole company together uh, for four days a year and act like we're one company. And we like to you know, recognize the achievements from the previous year and set goals for the next year. Uh, our strategy is actually on our t-shirts, scaling everywhere with innovation and double-digit growth. And so people you know, know that when they come back uh, from Mexico. And I try to remind people that when you are using HipChat or WhatsApp or Snapchat or whatever your communication device is, and you're talking to another SendGritter on the other side, remember they're smart, they're hardworking, and they have good intentions. And sometimes that is lost when you're using electronic communication. And you can get, it's easy to get frustrated with people. So that's been probably one of our biggest challenges early on has been to keep the communication among departments and different, now different levels within departments. So, so when people talk about like culture and they're like, oh, let's have a ping pong table, like you're, you're looking at culture as a much bigger animal. You're looking at culture as like the relationships, people's temperament towards each other and all that kind of stuff. At, at what point is a company maybe too small to be thinking about culture at that scale? So you're never too small to be thinking about culture. So I think it really starts with, you know, if you and I were to start a company together, right, just how you pick your co-founders. And it really starts with, you know, step one is know yourself, right? What are your own values? Uh, it was the summer of 2003. I had been fired for the second time from 
responsible positions as a VP of sales or a CFO of venture back companies. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm married, I've got kids, I should not be getting fired so much. <laughs> and uh, you know, so why is that happening? And so I thought, you know, getting fired, there's conflict. And it's a good exercise to think back on your life about where you've had conflict with people and recognize that's two value systems running into each other. And try to say, what value were you expressing? What value were they expressing? Not judging, right? They're just different. Uh, in that case, it was uh, like openness. As a CFO, I like to tell people pretty much everything, you know, in real time, you know, all the time. Just very wide open. Uh, but I worked for a CEO who liked to play it close to the best on a need-to-know basis only. And there's not like a, a right way or wrong way. There's just different ways. And obviously, we had a lot of conflict because I'd want to tell employees what our cash balance was, what our burn rate was, and you know how we're doing on financing you know, plans. And it's, uh, it's very much related to another value of trust first. I like to put trust out, and you get trust back. So I had that summer to kind of think about uh, what those values were, and then how to express them, and how to interview for them. Because I wanted to interview a management team, make sure I fit, and wouldn't get fired again, and have those uncomfortable conversations with your spouse at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. You're like, hi, honey, I'm home. It's like, what are you doing here? It's like, eh. <laughs> so that was that summer we came up with the 4-H system. Honest, hungry, humble, happy. Uh, and it's a way to interview people for that culture. Uh, when I evaluated looking at joining Sangrid, that was my only criteria. It wasn't market size and all that stuff. It was like, is it a 4-H board? Are they 4-H founders? And so by spending time with them, uh, there's behavioral intertech. There's good questions like the happy variable surprises people. That's one of the four variables. And uh, the, qu the interview question is, what do you do for fun outside of work and family? And what you elicit are passion stories. And you want deep passion stories that reflect a lot of goals and striving, a lot of the hunger, whatever other values. And it, you know, and it makes it very you know, interesting and, and fun and dynamic uh, workplace. So I think that that culture starts right with the co-founders. Uh, and then through the you know, management layer and to employees, but also to customers, partners, and most importantly, shareholders. So you want to make sure that your shareholders are well aligned with your culture from, the, from day one. You guys work with a lot of web agencies, web professionals, freelancers. I mean, you guys have tons of those types of clients. What's maybe one or two things that you see them doing that maybe they could do differently or better? The, just the use of you know, APIs is that there are so many that whatever problem you're trying to solve, if you find yourself writing anything custom, there's probably a web service out there for that. Uh, and if there isn't, that would be a great project for a you know, startup weekend or, or somewhere else. I think maybe just that sense of awareness, that if you feel like you're doing something that's rote, you think, wow, there's got to be a better way. You know, the API economy is so robust, there probably is something that's been built out there as a web service you can call to help make you more efficient in your work. Now, do you find that um, companies still are probably writing too much of their own custom features and they're not, they're not doing enough of that? Yes, we find that really across our customer base, I think that's part of working with early stage uh, founder types, there's a strong sense of, I can do that. Again, it's that how hard can it be mentality. How hard can it be to set up your email or your billing system or your document storage or whatever it may be. And that yeah, the rule one of cloud computing and Bessemer's top ten laws is thou shalt use other cloud services. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think that that's, you know... Uh, that's a good that, one. That, I might, we might that, be writing that on, on one of our walls that's or something a good like that. One. It, back. Yeah, specifically at Sengrid, we found some limitations to that. Uh, Rackspace is a great partner, but when you really become part of the cloud, like Sengrid has, then you really need to own your own, your own stack. And so we have our own data center uh, now in San Jose, and then Softlayer is a, a key partner for us as well. But... There are some limitations to those rules, but that, that is definitely a great general rule is really trust other cloud services. That really makes you faster, and they're very cheap uh, to use and to get started with. In terms of strategy, one of the things, um, when I talk to web pros, it feels like sometimes they have like, it'll be like a two-person business, and they have like three or four go-to-market strategies. You know, you're like, who's your customer, right? And they're like, ah, oh, businesses. You know, like, how have you guys picked your strategy in terms of what kind of markets you're going after? And is it really specific, or do you guys just have like a broad spaghetti of the wall type of thing? That's a great question. I work with a lot of startups in many capacities, and uh, I love to ask this question. How big can you be just doing what you're doing today? 
And they said, oh, well, if we just do this one market, we'll be a $100 million business. I'm like, great. And I don't need to hear about all those other things you want to go do. <laughs> Let's just focus on that one, right? That, this one market and see how big you can be doing that. Uh, I, 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 having looked at and been part of a lot of venture-backed companies, about, I've got a sense for what you can do with $5 million, 50 people, three years, right? That's just, you know, that's like a unit of work. It can solve a, a fairly narrow thing. And it's just a chronic problem among uh, early stage companies to think that they can go do many things simultaneously. And I, I look at them and say, you know, you and what army? Uh, so at Syngrid, having, you know, now 200 people, uh, it's a pretty good sized group of people. Uh, and it's remarkable how it's a paradox of focus that the more you focus in, the more opportunity you see. So rather than say, oh, we wanted to go do uh, SMS and we want to do in-app notifications and let's become the, you know, the enterprise communication API layer of cloud computing, uh, you know, those are different companies. That's what Urban Airship does on the one side and Twilio does on the other side. And it takes you know, all of our attention to really just focus on doing this one thing very well. And even for that, we do it for early stage companies. Uh, if you're a healthcare company or a financial services company, uh, or if you are a you know, global 2000 company, you might not like uh, what we do. Uh, some of those companies like, uh, have asked for Sengrid in a box. They want an on-prem version of what we do. And we're like, there's no one around here who is thinking <laughs> about putting Sengrid in a box and sticking it behind the firewall. You know, we're all cloud, and so you really have to have that uh, strategic discipline to stay focused on doing one thing very, very well. That being said, uh, I think that a, uh, a focus of about 80% uh, is the ideal. So if you can have 80% of your energy, what I call on the oak tree, on your big thing, uh, which is for us the email infrastructure for developers, that I think it's good to have some saplings, some small trees nearby. Uh, so at Sengrid, we did uh, listen to our developer customers, ask for an application on top of our infrastructure, uh, which is our newsletter application. So it can be used by non-developers, but mostly it's used by developers to send newsletters to their, you know, their growing customer bases. And that was interesting for us to see, you know, what can we do with the application layer rather than the infrastructure layer? Uh, and we learned a lot. We learned that we send two billion, two billion of those newsletters per month. We know there's good traction. And that if you were to partner with SendGrid and tie into our infrastructure, you get big scale fast, which is really valuable for, uh, for partners coming in uh, like our own newsletter application. Um, but we also uh, have some acorns. So you have your big oak tree, the big thing we do. And we have a a sapling like the newsletter application, but then it's nice to have some acorns spread around to the forest floor as well. And we have SendGrid Labs uh, in Rhode Island, so it's physically separated from the rest of the business. And it's just a few people, I think it's six now, um, but it looks much like a Techstars team. Uh, and they can knock out projects about once per quarter, kind of on that 90-day cadence. And there are other cloud services that our core developer audience uh, would like to have. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's that need for other APIs that you find yourself doing things and they're repetitive. Like you think, wow, there must be a better way. It's like that's what our labs group is creating. So we launched a product called Loader.io, which does load testing applications, and we had over 10,000 signups in the first 90 days. Wow. So that tells us again, as an organization, we can learn that wow, there was a, a series of projects in the pipeline and labs that we can bring to our core audience of developers that they find relevant and useful. What daily, weekly, or monthly practice have you kind of kept up with that's gotten you to where you are today? Daily, weekly, monthly. So lifelong learner. And you learn by teaching, of course, is one famous saying, right? He who teaches learns. So I do like to teach others uh, through a variety of mechanisms, whether it's founders, dude, or tech stars, or more formal. But mostly it's an informal network of people who have you know, started and raised money and have made some progress. Much like, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, when I was 28 years old and a CFO, uh, other people would help me a lot learn things. It's been great to, to pay that forward and see those cycles uh, go forward. So part of the reason I like commuting between Boulder and Denver is doing uh, audiobooks. And people wonder, how can you read so much? Well, I've spent a lot of time on planes and a lot of time in the car. And I'm always cranking through uh, material uh, in those venues. I think having some uh, you know, consistent patterns about how we work, uh, having the, uh, we do daily stand-ups at 11.30 every day, 
We do uh, the weekly all hands is very important. That is the stand up? Is that a team based thing? I mean, obviously you have two management employees. Team, so I have uh, yep. So you start off with two employees, or you get you know, that first five or ten uh, doing that stand. Just gonna, it's amazing how much happens in a day in a business. Just to kind of take out any little blocks. Uh, Patrick Lencioni wrote an excellent book called Death by Meeting. Uh, he called it a CNN headline meeting, right? Just headlines <laughs> and a few quick clarifying questions. It's a great uh, format. That's another consistent thing is about uh, how I run meetings. It's called the 3D method, download, discuss, and decide. Uh, so it's live agendas. You show up and there's a whiteboard with a marker and you put three Ds on the top and whoever's at that meeting uh, you know, creates the agenda. You know, from this group, I need to download. I'm going to tell this group something. Like, we are moving the office on May 1st, so have your stuff backed up. Or we, I might need a discussion. Like, I'm considering, you know, what I should do. You know, should I uh, should try to start a trade show uh, program? And, you know, I want some wisdom of this crowd about what, what might be a good, you know, lessons learned on how to track results or something like that. Or I might have a decision. Do I need a decision from this group, you know, today? It's like, I may make, make, make a decision on our uh, new logo for some product. And we have to go to the printers, so do you like the first one, second one, or third one? <laughs> uh, and really having clarity through the different types of conversations makes meetings much more uh, effective and pleasant, especially the distinction between discussions and decisions. So if you own a particular function, say it's you know, sales, you might want to have a discussion about, well, should we have you know, a, another layer of management between this person and that person? You don't want the group to hijack that into a decision. Because discussions have a way of sort of morphing into decisions. But as the discussion owner, you can say, thank you very much. I've had <laughs> enough discussion on that topic. And you reserve you know, the right that it's your decision. And as the meeting facilitator, what I do, I make sure we kind of stay in those zones. And if, if we want to make a decision, I'll ask the person, like, are you ready to move forward with the decision on this? Do you want to have us go through that uh, process? Uh, and we have a process for how we go through decisions. It's called PROACT. You know, what's the problem, objective, alternatives, consequences, and trade-offs? Just put it across the whiteboard, and it's amazing how much time you spend on what's the problem we're trying to solve. Oh, I thought it was a different problem, right? <laughs> uh, what are the alternatives? People always think there's one alternative or two alternatives. Uh, handy trick is just to write like one, two, three on the whiteboard, and people will keep giving suggestions until you hit three. So then put four, five, six, and they'll give you more suggestions. And then rip out another sheet of paper and put one, two, three again. And you'll get lots of alternatives. And it's a really kind of creative way then to look through the consequences, trade-offs, and to come up with a collaborative uh, decision on something. So there's a, a handful of uh, habits, like lifetime learner, or you know, how to run meetings that are things that I do on a daily basis. Now, are these, are these things, I mean, you, you've, you've gone off with several acronyms and things like that. I mean, are these learned things, or are these like Jim Franklin originals? Well, it's all a mishmash of stuff. Uh, so the four H's is, let's say, I uh, came up with H, three H's and an S. Uh, and it was a few months later that another fellow, Dave Fredericks, I've worked with a long time, we eliminated the S, which stood for smart, uh, and then that got replaced as a happy. Because we look at uh, sort of exit interviews, and when we fire someone, say, well, why did that person not work out? You know, why was it a hiring failure? What did we miss in the interview process? And so by iterating on that, that's how we were able to kind of refine uh, that process. Uh, the three Ds, uh, worked with uh, Bernie Dana, who's a famous PhD industrial psychologist around Colorado that uh, has helped a lot of venture back companies. And he had this uh, concept of like, you know, tell, talk uh, approach. And so, but I like to repackage it into something people can remember in the three Ds. So it's a mix of things. Patrick Lencioni, uh, he wrote one of his books, had the hunger, humble duality. And then I was like, yes, that's the key, especially uh, like with salespeople. You want people who are hungry, you know, high striving, but humble, can learn from others. Uh, so there's a lot of adaptation and uh, mixing of together of these things. Nice. What's one thing that you've learned over the last couple decades that maybe you wish you knew two decades ago? Well, the thing I've learned in the last three years at Sengrid, <laughs> I wish I knew, <laughs> is scaling is hard. Uh, I've never been uh, as fortunate to be part of a business that was scaling so quickly. Um, some things I learned, uh, I guess, along the way is to think about business in three phases. Uh, called mousetrap. You know, does your thing work? Uh, and there's mousetrap people, like, you know, founders, people who build stuff. Uh, there's GTM, go to market. You need people who, you know, think about sales and pricing and channels and uh, all that. So are people buying your stuff or are you selling it or something happening on that side? And then FinOps is that VP of stuff role, someone to make sure that the leases are signed and the payroll works and you don't run out of cash. I think kind of having that framework 
early on gives you more uh, clarity about a business. And it, uh, saying that our stuff works and people buy it and we've got good access to capital. So I wonder what we talk about all day. Uh, <laughs> or other you know, boards are involved in other companies and you know, usually you'll have one of them solved. Like, hey, we've got a great product, but it's like, hey, let's, we haven't figured out the go-to-market yet. And cash is tight, or it'll get tight soon, right? That's a classic uh, sort of situation where you'll have uh, a good product, you'll raise money, but it's like, okay, raising money doesn't help you solve a sales problem. It just gives you ammo to run a bunch of tests and you know, try and find the right way to go. I think maybe one lesson over you know, a 20-year arc as I might have been less nice. I think that being Midwestern by background and generally polite person, uh, being nice um, seems nice, uh, but it's not as helpful to entrepreneurs. So as I find as I work with other people, I've become less nice and more direct. Uh, so if I see someone's obviously heading down a wrong road, I'll be like, hey, mm. But oftentimes when I work with people, I like to always find the way it could work. Because if uh, some entrepreneur comes to you and says, hey, what about this idea? You can always say no, and you'll be right 99% of the time. Because most ideas, you know, don't work, <laughs> right? There's, it's like a combination lock, right? There's like 100 variables you gotta spin and get right. And the founders of SendGrid got most of them right from the get-go. Uh, but most businesses, it takes a long time. That's why you have to raise money and get that runway to keep spinning the locks until you find the combination that solves and then the revenue uh, takes off. And that's just your first product market fit, and then you have to go do it again and, uh, and go do it again. So I think being more direct uh, with people about, that's not going to work, you know, save your money. So I come up with a system, uh, three milestones, right? So when people are all enthusiastic about their thing, it's like, hey, we're going to go do this, right? It's like, great, go do it. And I, here's a way it might work, and let's go lean into that. However, let's set up three milestones. That, you know, if you don't get a co-founder, if you can't get the technology to work, you don't get a first customer, you don't get an independent check from, you know, someone who's not your mother, brother, fraternity brother or something, right? It's like some validation. You know, when do you quit? Not pivot, but just done. You say, I'm going to go try something else, right? As I've seen people go all the way into the ground so deeply, they're not able to recover. You know, come back and, you know, live another day in another entity, right? And go, you know, try and make something else work. And so I think if you set up those three milestones... The reason it's three is when the first one goes by, you'll make excuses for yourself because you're all excited about your thing, right? <laughs> and when the second one doesn't work, you're going to make excuses for yourself because you're all excited about your thing. But when that third milestone goes by and you miss it, you know, try to remember this conversation we're having. You say, I remember that guy I met in Colorado, and he's like, yeah, I missed three things. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this isn't the thing I should mortgage my house and spend my 401k on and, you know, essentially bankrupt my children and just go augering all the way in on. And maybe I should rethink what I'm doing so that we can uh, you know, live for another day. In terms of uh, startup founders, do you suggest companies go solo into the founder space or they have co-founders? I'm a huge fan of co-founders. So I think that the best thing you can be as a co-founder, the second best thing you can be as a founder, and somewhere down the way, you know, CEO. I, I forget that people think being a CEO is like a good thing. Uh, so I talked to a lot of uh, startups, uh, like a, you know, like a tech stars class, you might have 30 people in the room, and I'll ask them, how many of you are CEOs? And all these hands go up. I said, about 10 minutes from now, you won't think so. I said, who likes to attend meetings? <laughs> who likes to, you know, hang out with lawyers and accountants? You know, it's like, no, they don't want to do that. I said, who likes to build stuff? Oh, the hands go back up again, right? So it's like, you like to build teams, get results through others. I mean, I think of a CEO as just a person who, the E, it's execution. Someone's got to actually do the business part. They've got to hire people and sign leases and do all that work of the business. Where I think as a founder, especially a co-founder, it's much more interesting to think about the business design, right? What is our mission? How are we going to go to market? What's the product going to look like? How are we going to raise money? How does this all sort of fit together? Uh, the doing the part of it, that's what you can hire a CEO to hire a management team and you know, go, do, go do all that execution uh, part of it. What trends are you following right now? Well, uh, one reason I joined SendGrid uh, was you know, cloud computing and SaaS is all new to me, as well as email. So I have a number of trends, right, that were brand new. So why did they hire me? Well, I have a, a long-term interest in startups, right? So it's great that uh, startups have gone mainstream and are cool on a global basis. Uh, so we pay a lot of attention uh, to that trend. But really uh, watching how cloud computing is being adopted uh, geographically, sort of how it spreads across the globe, uh, has been fun to see, and that's a big part of our growth. Uh, but also the migration from, uh, I mean, really raw startups uh, to enterprises. 
So we talk to the world's largest customers, largest companies through our partners at Google, IBM, and Microsoft. And what we find is that if you are you know, selling HP, Dow, all of these partners of ours, if you're selling into the you know, enterprise IT, you know, cloud computing is a huge shift. And just like there's been the consumerization of IT, of that enterprise IT, uh, there's a similar parallel dynamic going on where the, a developer who works for a global 2000 company might be spending his nights and weekends at a hackathon where he runs into our developer evangelist and learns about SendGrid. And then he brings SendGrid back to his day job. So when he's building a production product for a major company, he started to think about, oh, I'll use cloud services. Well, when I was at Oracle four years ago, that would have been like you know, heretical to say, you're going to use some cloud service in a production environment? I mean, that's the kind of shit we rip out when we acquire <laughs> companies, right? It's like, it's got a big, big red machine, right? It's all built here. It's all uh, integrated one solution, right? And so there's been a huge shift in the last even six months uh, from what, where we can see is that you know, inside the enterprise IT world, there's this acceptance of cloud services. And so for us, that's a huge you know, adjacent market to not be just with the raw startups, but with people starting new things, but at very large companies and being open to using cloud services to do their jobs you know, better, faster, cheaper. Very cool. What's uh, 200 people now where SendGrid's at? Are you guys continuing up the scale curve? Are you guys continuing to have explosive growth? You bet. So uh, I counted by our Mexico trips. You know, the first year we had about 50 people there. The next year we had 120. Last year was 180. Next year will be about 240. Uh, the year after that will be about 300. Uh, I've not scaled a company through this particular growth phase, so I look out to, you know, to mentors and other people who have scaled companies from 200 to 1,000. And, I think we'll be able to keep that trip going maybe up to 500 people. <laughs> uh, a good tip if you're a product company, uh, it's about 200,000 uh, per head in revenue is a really helpful rule of thumb. And so if you're at 500 people, that's about 100 million in revenue. So it's 500 times the 200,000 uh, per head. So it's a great way to translate if uh, companies are shy about saying what the revenue numbers are, just ask them how many employees they have. <laughs> Multiply by 200,000, and it's a remarkably accurate predictor of revenues. Uh, now, if you have a bunch of funds raised, you might be able to hire ahead of that. But over time, you can look and kind of tell that unless people are living on borrowed money, that's kind of where revenues shake out on a per head basis. Very cool. Well, Jim, we appreciate you taking the time for us today. Wish you guys all the best. Hopefully, we'll see you again on the program sometime in the future. Great. Thanks for coming to Sengrid today. Absolutely. All right. Well, stay tuned for more great content from yougurus.com. CEO and Master Chief or anything. No. <laughs> sometimes, the, it's funny, the, the smaller companies get, the more titles sometimes they have. You know, they'll be like, I'm president, CEO, and founder. Okay. And chairman. Right. And chairman, right? <laughs> Worldwide chairman. <laughs>